2014. My name is Greg Burns. Today we've invited guest speaker Sven Alderman to talk about using Windows Server 2012 R2 clustering for SQL Server. This is a level 200 session intended for the IT admin. But first, let's go over some user group news. Our meetings are generally held on the second Thursday of the month here at the offices of Network Business Systems in Anchorage, Alaska. We also broadcast the meetings via WebEx, and I record them all and post them right up to the Alaska SQL YouTube channel. Each month, we invite people to speak about SQL Server with topics for both developers and IT admins because DBA generally sits on the border between the dev and IT universes. This month, the topic is SQL clustering. On June 12th, Guy Glancer will be showing us all the new stuff coming our way in SQL Server 2014. And in July, Ryan Adams is going to tell us how to manage your SQL Server instances using central management server and policy-based management. I'd like to thank my employer, Network Business Systems, for providing the meeting space and the WebEx broadcast. Thanks, MBS. Alaska SQL User Group is an official chapter of the Professional Association for SQL Server. PASS is for data professionals throughout the world who use the Microsoft Data Platform. If you'd like to join, head on over to www.sqlpass.org. It's free. First, the elections for the PASS board members is coming, coming up, so uh, you'll need to sign in to get a ballot. PASS is always looking for volunteers. If you'd like to lend a hand, you can say so in your profile, and whenever opportunities come by, they'll let you know. You never know, it could be fun. Aside from all the local chapters like this one, PASS has a bunch of virtual chapters they run through the PASS website. They have lots of different groups with uh, something for everyone. There's new stuff happening every month. Here are this month's virtual chapter meetings. Cool stuff, especially if you speak Russian. And here's the upcoming SQL Saturday events. Nothing in Alaska at this time, but if you happen to be in Redmond on May 31st, it could be a cool party to crash. The Past Summit is coming up in November, where you can rub elbows with your fellow SQL geeks and learn all the hot new technologies. And so here's all the past contact info if you'd like to join up or just uh, check them out on Facebook or Twitter. So I've been working with Windows clustering since 2006, and it used to be a real headache to set one up. It never seems to go smoothly. There's so many things to, to line up, uh, like buying identical servers and setting up storage and networking, configuring Active Directory accounts and security, and the cluster uh, might easily take more than one attempt to install it. Not to mention the fact that you need a small army of IT admins and storage admins and DBAs and networking folks. But each version of Windows has made some pretty giant leaps in clustering. And with Windows 2012 and, and Windows 2012 R2, it's an entirely different beast. It's so easy that it might even be in the reach of uh, normal people like you and me. So today's presentation is about how to use all the cool new features in Windows Server 2012 R2 to create a cluster for SQL Server. Our presenter, Sven Alterman, is a lecturer in information systems at Troy University in Troy, Alabama. He teaches undergraduate courses in data warehousing and network infrastructure and security. He also is the technology specialist for the Sorel College of Business and performs a variety of technology roles with a global scope. He's also a consultant uh, working with Aduxis, uh, where he assists customers with software development projects using uh, Microsoft.net. And he's also the co-author of a book called The Art of SQL Server File Stream. So, thanks for joining us, Sven. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so it's a pleasure to present to the Alaska SQL User Group. This is probably about the first group I've presented to, and unfortunately, uh, not in person. I'd love to visit Alaska one of these days. However, I want to put in a special pitch uh, for Troy, Alabama, 
This was the map uh, that was on the front cover of the New York Times uh, just yesterday, uh, indicating some of the hot and cold zones as a result of climate change. And Troy, Alabama uh, it was actually pointed out there as one of those zones that whose average temperatures have actually dropped um, in the past, uh, I think, decade or decade and a half or so uh, that that uh, research was conducted for. So if Alaska is getting too hot for you, then uh, I'm sure we have a spot for you here in beautiful Troy, Alabama. So I, I don't have much in terms of slides. Uh, we're, we're talking just a little bit uh, with some slides on defining high availability and uh, talking about some of the planning, but primarily I intend to uh, to demo and, and using the demos talk a little bit about the network, about the Windows infrastructure that you need, about uh, about some storage considerations, uh, different uh, different things like that. We'll at the end hopefully have some time left over uh, to, uh, to bust some myths and also to confirm some myths regarding high availability in, in SQL Server. So we're going to go ahead and delve right in. So just very quickly, when we think about high availability, um, there, there's often, uh, with people that I've spoken to, uh, somewhat of a uh, thinking that uh, high availability, or, or I shouldn't say high availability, but that clusters are going to give them improved performance. And so that's when you get into the discussion of high availability versus scalability. Now, when we talk about high availability and Windows and SQL clusters, then we're really talking about increasing uptime rather than increasing performance, which is what scalability would all be about. Now, there are some things that you can do with clusters to improve performance, but it really doesn't have anything to do with the cluster itself. It's, uh, it's things that you can do to improve performance on any SQL Server instance. So just wanted to make, uh, make that clear right up front that High availability in clusters have to do with uptime, not with performance. So um, we're talking about Windows Server and its failover cluster feature. And when you think about these things, um, uh, Greg and I had a brief discussion before the start of the session about the history of it. And when I built the first SQL Server uh, cluster uh, that I was involved with about 14 years ago in SQL 2000 and Windows Server 2000, or it wasn't called Windows Server 2000, it was called Windows 2000 Server back then, um, we, we had a lot more uh, things to consider. One of the big things was compatibility of, of the hardware. You pretty much had to buy um, all certified hardware and all of your nodes in your cluster had to be perfectly identical. Anything from processor stepping uh, to uh, the amount of RAM, the speed of the RAM, and so on had to be identical for Microsoft uh, to support it. That meant mostly that hardware vendors were very happy to sell you all those things at increased cost. That is one of those things that has changed. Today, Microsoft will support a failover cluster environment as long as all of the hardware individually is on the hardware qualification list. And that's, that's all that really matters. Um, so you can have uh, different nodes in your cluster environment that have different specifications. Now, for some reasons, that doesn't necessarily make it a good idea. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you have to. But it um, does open up some more opportunities. Shared storage is uh, also something that uh, sometimes causes some confusion uh, in terms of uh, especially having um, uh, the, the feature in SQL Server 2012 that is called always on availability groups where you do not need any shared storage for that. But if you want to build a Windows failover cluster with Windows, uh, excuse me, with SQL Server failover cluster instances, you will need shared storage at some point. And of course, that shared storage only does you good if you can have high availability in the shared storage. Now, virtualization, though, has helped out a lot with that. Um, certainly, the, the traditional SAN environment, and that could be Fiber Channel or iSCSI or Fiber Channel over Ethernet, those SANs are, of course, uh, still good choices for failover clustering, but there are other alternatives out there today. One of the things that I'm experimenting with, uh, or that I have been experimenting with in the past few months, is actually virtual sense, is software technology that can 
take the local storage that is in your servers, direct attached to your servers, and expose it uh, either as a virtual iSCSI target that is replicated amongst all of the nodes in your clusters, uh, or uh, that exposes it as a native Microsoft cluster resource. Uh, so two different approaches, but they achieve the same thing. They take the local disks that are in your server, which are generally much, much cheaper than any type of SAN or even externally direct attached storage, um, and sometimes also faster, and, and make them usable as shared storage uh, for virtual SANs. Also a big change uh, that's come about with uh, Windows 2000 and then supported by, by SQL Server 2000 is that we can now use SMB3, uh, Server Message Block 3, the standard file sharing protocol, but it has to be version 3, but we can use SMB version 3 as our shared storage target. So that's a big deal. If you have a uh, Windows Server NAS um, that, uh, that's Windows Server 2012 or later, um, then you can use that as your search shared storage target. Now, regardless of what type of shared storage that you use, you do have to be very mindful of the fact that uh, high availability is only something that you're going to achieve if you actually have your storage highly available as well. It starts with the disks. They obviously should be in a RAID configuration. Um, I think today RAID 6 is probably um, your best choice uh, for, for that. Um, as a matter of fact, I've, I've taken a little bit further in, in our uh, fiber channel SAN. We've configured RAID 60, uh, which costs a lot more disks, but offers excellent performance uh, combined with excellent uh, availability uh, features, but it also goes a little bit beyond that. And, and near the end of the presentation, I'll talk about multi-path input-output and, and what effect uh, that has on the availability of, of your cluster. So uh, the network, we need to think a little bit about uh, the network elements. So uh, it does depend um, how many network connections you need on the storage technology you need. Uh, if you're going to be using iSCSI, to connect to your shared storage, then you would really need to have three physical network adapters uh, in your servers. Um, that is, uh, one uh, would be for your iSCSI traffic, and of course, ideally, you'd want that to be able to fail over, uh, but again, we'll talk about that as part of multi-path input-output discussion. And uh, then you need uh, two traditional network adapters uh, for, uh, for the cluster heartbeat. Uh, the cluster nodes at all times need to be able to communicate with each other. So you really want to make sure that's highly available. So that means two network adapters. Now, in virtual machines, it's of course trivial to start adding network adapters. And, and it could be just tempting to say that we'll, we'll create a virtual machine as one of our uh, nodes in uh, SQL Server, one of our SQL Server cluster nodes, and we'll just add some uh, network adapters to that that really all point to the same physical network. Well, that works. That'll get you a, a validated cluster configuration. But in reality, of course, you're just fooling yourself because you haven't really made any advances in assuring high availability. Now, other than the actual network uh, redundancy that you need to consider. You also need to think about the naming scheme as well as IP addresses uh, that you'll have to have available uh, for all of the different elements uh, as part of a cluster. And I'll address that a little bit more when I actually go into the demo and start building our cluster, uh, the considerations for naming and IP addressing. Quorum is often something that uh, server administrators, uh, cluster administrators don't like to talk about very much, uh, sometimes because it's not well understood, other times because uh, it's been somewhere in the behind previously. So Quorum is um, just as if you were having a meeting and decisions have to be made. You want some organizations have it in their bylaws at least that for a vote to be taken that you have to have quorum. In other words, uh, usually it refers to a majority of the members have to be present in order for the vote to be valid. Well, that is very much the same way you should think about quorum when you talk about your Windows failover cluster. What you want to make sure is that at any point in time, the cluster nodes that make up your cluster have the ability to have a majority vote. And this becomes important in case of trouble, either with a node or with communication between your nodes. Now, let's assume that 
um, your communication channels between your nodes have failed. And at that point, and, and we'll further assume uh, a two-node cluster, just a simple scenario. So with this two-node cluster, now you have two nodes that are each up and running, but unable to communicate with each other. Now you have the problem there that now which of these nodes in your cluster is going to be in charge? Which of these should continue running and which one should be shut down? Um, automatically this cannot be resolved as if both of these nodes only have one vote. So that's where you want to introduce a quorum witness. Now traditionally, and, and I'm saying traditionally meaning before Windows Server 2012, this was done by reserving a shared disk just to act as the tiebreaker, if you wish, in a uh, SQL Server cluster with an uh, even number of nodes. Whichever set of nodes um, had the uh, shared disk ownership would have an extra vote. The, the witness uh, vote would go to that set of nodes. So in this two node cluster scenario, one of the two nodes would have ownership of the shared disk. That would give that node two votes instead of one vote and we'd have a majority and the node without the majority would shut down its services and the node uh, that has the shared disk would um, uh, would, would have two votes and would keep running the cluster. This avoids either your cluster going down entirely or your cluster uh, having a situation that's referred to as a split cluster whereby you have uh, the nodes in your cluster no longer communicating and maybe an administrator uh, forcefully uh, starting services on all nodes and uh, then you really have two SQL Server instances that are the same instance uh, trying to access the same storage at the same time and you can imagine all of the bad news that could follow from that. Now Quorum leaves a, a bad taste in, in some people's mouths when it comes to uh, to administering that because it sometimes was difficult to configure it. Well, in 2012 R2, in Server 2012 R2, um, there uh, is now the automatic configuration of the quorum. Anytime a cluster configuration is changed, and of course specifically either adding or removing a node to the cluster, the quorum will be automatically reconfigured. In addition to that, one of the improvements that we've seen in, in Server 2012, you don't have to wait until 2012 or 2 for that improvement, uh, is the ability to use a file share as a witness. It no longer has to be one of the shared disks or, or some LUN on your uh, shared storage that needs to be the, the witness. You can use a file share as the witness. So that's, a, that's another improvement as well. We'll, we'll see that as we build our cluster um, exactly how that's configured. Uh, Active Directory, we, we need to have Active Directory. So it's not possible to build a Windows failover cluster um, uh, with non-domain members. Now in uh, Server 2012 R2, one of the things that has changed is that it is now possible to run services that are Active Directory detached. So uh, we, we can now create a cluster resource, as they're called, and, and we'll see exactly what we mean by that, but we can now create a cluster resource whose virtual network name is no longer an Active Directory computer object. That is possible, and it could theoretically be used for, for SQL Server instances. Um, if, if you don't want your uh, SQL Server instances uh, to be Active Directory uh, enabled, uh, then you could do that. Uh, but remember that regardless of whether or not your cluster resources are Active Directory detached or traditionally Active Directory attached then. Um, your nodes, the, 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 the physical uh, nodes or the, uh, the virtual nodes, the, the operating system instances, they actually need to be Active Directory joined. So you're not getting away from that requirement. And then we'll also need to talk a little bit about MSDTC. That's, that's a fairly advanced concept when it comes to clustering, but you need to pay some attention to it. There are lots of different options, but only a few that are really uh, going to work well. Okay, so we're not going to talk much more uh, about, uh, about planning and so on. Uh, we're going to go into a demo. A uh, few brief notes though about node counts. Um, so uh, as it relates uh, to SQL instances, you, it, you can run more than one SQL instance on a single cluster. Now when you start running multiple instances uh, of SQL Server, 
uh, on a single cluster, then you'll need to start thinking about the cluster node count as well. Ideally, you really want to have a standby node at all times. So if you're going to run a single SQL Server instance, you can very easily do that on a two-node cluster. As a matter of fact, at that point, a three- or multiple-node cluster really doesn't make sense anymore. But you can run two SQL instances on a two-node cluster. Now, at that point, you can start achieving some scalability by running a single instance, preferably one on each node, one, one of your SQL Server instances on each of your Windows Server nodes. That'll give you some scalability. But what it also calls is that if one of the nodes goes down, now you have two SQL Server instances running on a single node. That, of course, could lead to things such as disk contention, memory, uh, um, uh, memory pressure, and, and, and all related things. So that's why I say uh, your node count, ideally, is going to be your SQL Server instance count plus one. Always have a standby node, and in regular, during normal operations, uh, always have your SQL Server instances, one instance per uh, cluster node. Makes perfect sense, uh, of course, um, although some initial planning may be required. We'll talk about Active Directory structure uh, in a little bit. I want to go ahead and go on to the demo. Um, I've done some initial operating system preparation already. I've, I've uh, configured some of my NICs. Um, I've done the domain join of the operating systems that I'm going to use to build my cluster. A few things that I haven't done yet is actually install the failover clustering feature. Um, I am also uh, still need to connect to my shared storage. Uh, and then we're going to run the cluster validation wizard and actually create the cluster. So uh, specifically in this demo environment that I'm going to be using today, what I have is a domain controller. Uh, DC0, oops, excuse me, DC01, and I have a NAS, uh, which is network attached uh, storage, and of course, because I'm running everything here in virtual machine, what I've done is my NAS is a simple Windows Server uh, 2012R2 uh, iSCSI target uh, with multiple LUNs. But that by itself is not highly available, so you wouldn't want to do that in production. And uh, I have a few cluster nodes here in my first failover cluster. They're right now, they're not running, they're shut down. That cluster's already been built, we'll use it later. And then uh, for the cluster that I'm going to build right now, I have prepared two nodes, uh, FC02A and FC02B. And so that leads me... Uh, to talk just briefly about naming conventions for your virtual machine names or your physical node names. Uh, in my case, FC, of course, stands for failover cluster. And then the 02, simply because this is my second failover cluster. And then the nodes within the failover cluster, I usually give them uh, simply a letter of the alphabet, A, B, and so on. Uh, that, that works well for me. As we'll see, uh, we need to uh, think about some more names uh, in, in uh, going forward even than just those two uh, node names. Now, here I am in uh, the server manager on uh, node B. And uh, on this node, I'm going to go and install the failover cluster feature. And I know that the screen resolution uh, between my screen and your screen over there does not match all that well, so I'm going to use uh, Zoom it uh, on, on a regular occasion uh, to go through this uh, these steps. So the Add Roles and uh, Features Wizard, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go, there we go. Oh. Uh, okay, that's not that great. Let me try uh, try a different, uh, different mode of doing that. Um, so the Add Roles and uh, Features Wizard first page gives some information. Uh, uh, four roles and features. The server selection is all fairly straightforward. I'm going to select my node uh, B here, as you can see, uh, to add the, the feature. So it's not a server role. So I'm going to move away from the server roles page, and I'm going to locate the failover clustering uh, role, uh, excuse me, failover clustering feature here. And uh, that's the one that I'm going to select. It, Windows will very helpfully ask me if I would like to add uh, the administration tools uh, for, the, for the cluster uh, feature. And I'll go ahead and let it do that um, because we'll need those graphical administration tools in a little while. Uh, just uh, for those of you who might be curious, it is in fact possible 
uh, to build a uh, a cluster in server core uh, without without the GUI, uh, and it is even possible to then run SQL Server in server core mode uh, on top of a uh, server core uh, cluster. Uh, but that makes for a fairly poor demo, so that's why I chose not to do that uh, here today. So the uh, feature installation is in progress. Uh, the uh, installation of the failover clustering feature is fairly quick and um, it does not require a reboot, so we'll, we'll be done here with this part in, uh, in just a second. Um, I've cheated a little bit in, on my A node. I've already done that. I've already done that installation of the failover cluster, so we don't have to go back uh, to that node. Um, and uh, the second step we're going to take uh, after installing the, the, the feature for failover clustering is I'm going to connect uh, to my shared storage. Uh, and uh, again, that's going to be an iSCSI target running on a Windows server. So I'm going to go into the iSCSI uh, initiator uh, on my server. And uh, uh, that is uh, installed by default uh, these days on, on server 2012 and 2012 R2. I am going to see a message uh, indicating that the uh, iSCSI service is not running. And uh, would I like to uh, start the service now and have it start automatically each time the computer starts? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. And uh, the dialog box here for the iSCSI initiator shows up. Uh, what I first need to do uh, ideally is, uh, is allow for, for quick discovery. So what I'm going to do is in iSCSI, I'm going to discover the portal uh, that is uh, essentially the IP address of my uh, iSCSI uh, target uh, host. And uh, that's going to be, uh, I'm sorry, let me, uh, fix this IP address here. So that is going to be uh, this particular IP address and we'll just click OK. And then when I go back to targets, uh, we're going to see that right now my um, uh, target uh, NAS01 uh, has a, uh, a single target available for uh, this host. Um, and uh, you can kind of see in the name of that target uh, what I'm going to do with that. Uh, that is going to be the quorum for my second failover cluster and I'm going to connect to that. So the connection, of course, um, uh, for you might be different if you're using fiber channel or fiber channel over Ethernet. It may involve um, uh, drivers and, and software tools uh, specific to your, your storage vendor's uh, infrastructure. Okay, what I briefly want to show here uh, is, uh, is some configuration here. When I go uh, into the disks area of, uh, of my server now, I'm going to find that I have two disks. Uh, the one that is online and that is uh, 60 gig in size is uh, my uh, C drive, is, is the, the operating system drive of my cluster node. And then the one that's offline and only 512 megs in size, that is that iSCSI target. Uh, the 512 megs, of course, is probably not going to be something you'll use in a production environment to run a SQL server but it is plenty of space uh, to run your quorum. So what I need to do though, before this disk is usable, uh, I need to go ahead on one of my cluster nodes and bring it online. And I also need to go ahead and initialize the disk. Uh, it had not been, been formatted before. You see that becomes initialized as a GPT, the Buick partition table uh, style of partitioning. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, create a volume on that same disk, on that same shared disk. So I'm going to take the entire volume space. Uh, I'm going to assign a drive letter. And as we already know from the name of the target, this is going to be the quorum. And uh, I just like uh, mnemonics. And I'm going to assign it to drive letter Q for quorum. And we'll click next. Uh, I'll name the volume itself. Uh, quorum as well. And of course, I want to point out something here. Uh, technically, for the quorum, the allocation, the NTFS allocation unit size really doesn't matter all that much. But we know for SQL Server that we want to make sure it's 64K. So just uh, to uh, build a good habit, I'm going to give the uh, quorum disk 64K allocation unit size as well. And now I'm ready to create that volume. Okay, so to briefly recap, what I've done is connected to my iSCSI target, 
uh, taken one of the disks, the, actually the only one in that particular target, and um, I've connected it to one of my servers, brought it online, initialized it, and created a volume. And you'll see I'm only doing this on one disk at this time. You'll see why that becomes uh, why that becomes important. Uh, you don't want to do that on more than one disk um, yet. Even if, of course, you'll end up with multiple shared disks uh, for your SQL Server installation. You want to hold off a little bit on uh, initializing the other ones. Now I'm ready uh, to start the failover cluster installation itself. So in my oops, excuse me, I didn't mean to do that. In my uh, hello. In my uh, server, I have uh, uh, the, the failover cluster manager uh, tool installed that came when I installed the role. And when that graphical user interface uh, loads, uh, you won't really see much uh, because there is no cluster built yet. What is there, however, is the first step in uh, building your cluster, and that is to validate the configuration. Um, you uh, will find that that's a wizard, and I know real professionals don't use wizards, but in this case, you should make an exception because the validate configuration wizard is very valuable. Um, it's going to uh, first ask you for the names of all of the Windows uh, server nodes that are going to become nodes in that cluster, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let that uh, hopefully verify very quickly, the node A. Oh, I know what I did wrong. I made a typo. I don't know if anyone noticed it, but I typed in FC01 as the name of that node, and it should have been FC02. So we'll let it find out that that node, actually, I'm going to go ahead and cancel it and restart. That'll be quicker. So FC02 node A. And uh, that should go significantly faster. And uh, FC02 node B. So those are the names of my two nodes. And you can actually see that the wizard has done a uh, name lookup on that and uh, appended my domain name uh, to that uh, to the names that I've typed in. And next, uh, you get to choose what type of tests that you would like this wizard to run. Uh, now, usually uh, for building a cluster, you want to go ahead and run all the tests. Okay? Now, there is a reason why you may only want to run selected tests. And primarily, that is if you're going to extend an existing cluster and add an additional node. At that point, it probably doesn't make sense to run the storage tests because they will actually fail unless you have some spare shared storage sitting around that's not currently uh, assigned to any particular node, um, that, that test is going to fail anyway. Uh, so um, that's, that is the reason why you should only uh, uh, run selected tests. But in the initial building of it, you want to go ahead and uh, run all the tests. And it doesn't take very long. Uh, to do. Uh, all the tests include some networking tests, some Windows tests, and some uh, uh, some storage tests. Uh, so we'll let it uh, let it do that. Uh, I think I had one warning there, which uh, oh, oh, I have a, uh, some some uh, more than a warning there. Um, I'll let it finish and see what it is. Um, I wasn't uh, expecting uh, the warning. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that may have happened when I booted up my virtual machines is that uh, my one of my cluster nodes did not properly connect. There we go, to the shared storage. And uh, I'll go ahead and fix that right now. So um, I'm going to take a quick peek here and uh, cheat at something uh, for, uh, for just a second. OK, all right. So uh, I mistakenly believed that this node had already been uh, connected to my shared storage as well, but that was a mistake. So I'm going to take uh, take this online quickly, and uh, we should be able to to move on from there. And that's just another example of it. Doesn't matter how many times you run the same demo; it seems to work differently every time. Okay, so. Um, my uh, cluster um, wizard uh, is obviously failed to find some shared disks, and we'll deal with that in just a second. We'll rerun it. Uh, 
those tests. Um, but it's also doing right now, and this takes a while, this is probably the longest running uh, test of them all, is listing all of the software updates. Uh, by default, the, the cluster manager really does expect you uh, to have the same software updates, of course we're talking about the Windows updates uh, listed, the same driver versions and everything. Technically, you can probably go get away without that, um, but one of the things that, uh, that, that, that you really have to keep in mind when you're talking about a failover cluster, you're seeking high availability. You're also doing some pretty, uh, pretty interesting things. Um, you know, you're, you're running a service uh, one minute on one node, and then the next minute, or literally within a few seconds, you may be running it on a different node in, in, case, of, uh, in case of some technical issue or, or planned downtime for some of your nodes. And so that does require some attention um, to, uh, to these types of details, uh, driver version, software updates, uh, list of running services, uh, and so on. You should really take that into account um, and let this uh, wizard validate for you uh, that, uh, that all of these things are in fact in good order. Uh, so uh, it's past the software updates test. Uh, we shouldn't have uh, too much longer to go here um, with the uh, with the rest of the tests. Um, and then I'm just going to uh, going to have to go back uh, and uh, double check that my um, uh, that that my disk uh, my disk test will now pass. Um, so. We'll let that uh, run. Now, in the meantime, uh, while we're waiting for that, let me ask if there are uh, perhaps uh, any questions at this time. I'll, I'm, uh, I'll yes, take I have questions. No. Um, okay, maybe maybe okay. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, so uh, the new way of, of doing cluster storage in uh, Windows 2012 with the clustered shared volumes, is, is that the way to cluster uh, SQL? Okay, that's a, that's a great question, Greg. Uh, I'm assuming this is Greg at least uh, speaking. So, uh, cluster shared volumes, or, or CSVs as they're called, is, um, uh, is, is essentially a way to take your shared storage and, and make it available uh, to cluster resources in a little bit of a different way that was traditionally done. Um, actually, SQL Server 2014 is the first version of SQL to support that. And, and while I'm building a SQL Server 2014 cluster here, uh, I did not want to, to demonstrate that particular piece of it um, because of the, uh, uh, the fact that it's literally only SQL Server 2014 that supports it. Okay? So cluster shared volumes uh, uh, have come into play in, in Windows Server 2012, uh, but SQL Server 2012 didn't support them at the time. Okay? Only Hyper-V and, uh, and Scale-Out file servers uh, supported uh, uh, those things out of the box at the time. So it's taken, uh, it's taken the SQL Server team uh, an extra release uh, to, um, uh, to, catch, uh, to catch up with that. Okay? So does that answer your question, Greg? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Um, so here, uh, you know, we're going to see some uh, uh, some failures here, uh, actually warnings uh, for the shared uh, disks. Uh, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is uh, now that I've connected my disks, uh, my shared disks properly, I'm quickly going to go back and uh, uh, rerun. And, and because I know all the other tests uh, passed, I'm only going to run the uh, storage test right now because I want to make sure that... Uh, the actual building of the cluster is not going to cause a, a problem uh, with something unexpected. Uh, and there we go. Now we got some greens. Um, so if you're thinking about using a, uh, an iSCSI target uh, from a third-party vendor, uh, one of the big things that you're going to find is that not all vendors uh, support uh, some of these uh, SCSI uh, commands. Um, one, one of the particular ones that may not be supported is uh, SCSI 3 persistent reservations um, that need to be supported. Uh, some iSCSI targets, um, some of the NAS appliances, even, even some, of the, uh, some of the serious ones have not implemented uh, those SPC commands. Um, and so uh, that, that could uh, lead your test, uh, test to fail. But because I'm using uh, Server 2012 uh, targets, uh, that, that is implemented in those. Uh, as a matter of uh, just a question of curiosity here, uh, since I know many of you are, are in fact today running uh, failover clusters, um, what uh, what is your search, shared storage consist of? Is it iSCSI, Fiber Channel, something else? Oh, you're asking us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, well, uh, Ala's network has um, iSCSI to uh, NetApp on the back end. Um, okay, yeah, NetApp, okay, yeah, very popular choice for SQL, okay. All right. A anything else in, in that area below? 
Oh, okay. They're 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 uh, they're implementing fiber channel uh, now, uh, but the original. Oh no, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, you're actually implementing fiber channel now. Okay. Now most people are trying to get away from fiber channel because of the high cost of it. So, um, you know, I guess uh, government in Alaska is uh, uh, better off than we are of public education here in Troy, <laughs> here in Alabama. But uh, okay, that's that's good. Uh, so we, I, I run a fiber channel uh, shared storage as well. A fiber channel phone is very old though. Uh, we're looking, uh, we're pretty much looking to get rid of it and, and go with uh, uh, with a 10 gig uh, iSCSI SAN. So. Um, just, just it's interesting. Uh, is there any particular reason? I'm, I'm, I know I'm uh, taking up some time here, but I'm just curious. It's been a long time since I've heard someone say they're moving to fiber channel. So, is there any particular reason why uh, why you're using fiber channel? Well, it may be my misunderstanding from my. Uh, oh, sorry. It may be my misunderstanding of what my network guys were telling me we were doing. We were trying to get fast in the room, so we are going to fast. But I'm not. I thought it was that we were going to fiber channel. And I'll double check well, with them, but maybe they're going okay. fast iSCSI. Okay. Um, so, I mean, fi fiber channel, uh, there are certainly some uh, performance uh, possibilities there. Um, I think uh, the current uh, generation of fiber channel tops out at, uh, what's it, 16 gigabit per second, I think. Uh, I'm not that up to date on, on that particular part. Um, you know, so, so the 16, gig, uh, uh, 16 gigabit per second uh, fiber channel would outperform uh, a 10 gig uh, iSCSI, of course. Um, but the fact is it's a little bit easier with iSCSI uh, to do some type of... Uh, uh, teaming, uh, some type of NIC teaming uh, that will quickly get you 20, 30, 40 uh, gigabit per second. And, and at that point, it's a lot harder to accomplish with fiber channels. So, um, so it's an interesting uh, interesting choice. Uh, it's certainly a very expensive choice uh, if, you, if you do indeed go with 16 gig uh, fiber channel. So, um, But anyway, um, so my, this time uh, my tests uh, passed and uh, the wizard has been uh, helpful enough to uh, uh, automatically check this box uh, for me that says create a cluster now using the validated node. So I'll go ahead and let it do that. So we're really in a second uh, wizard here. And by the way, if you really don't like wizards, uh, there are in fact uh, command line uh, as well as PowerShell uh, options available uh, for you. So the first question that it's asking me is, well, what is the name going to be of this new uh, cluster? And the name that it's looking for, it's really looking for a computer name. Uh, they call it uh, here in the wizard an access point. And, and you'll see that, that uh, coming back later. A client access point is a name and an IP address of a cluster service. And the access point that it's asking for here is just the name of the cluster itself. Which name and which IP address do you want to use to actually administer the cluster? Okay, so uh, I have in my notes that I should be using dot 71 uh, for my cluster. So, uh, and my cluster name is gonna be FC02 failover cluster two. So click next, and really, other than that, it's just going to ask me if I'm really sure if what I just typed is correct, but there is a little box here that I want to draw uh, your attention to. It says, add all eligible storage to the cluster. Now, that box is checked by default, and, and usually that's really not going to harm you much, but remember that the only shared storage that I've prepared is my quorum disk. I haven't prepared any SQL Server shared storage yet. Now, um, if I had prepared SQL Server shared storage, you know, I have this 512 megabyte uh, quorum targets on, uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, I might have maybe a two terabyte target, which is going to hold my SQL Server databases. Well, what I wouldn't want to happen is that uh, the wizard, the cluster wizard, is going to take this two terabyte shared storage that I meant for SQL Server and take it as the quorum witness disk. Now, it probably wouldn't do that, uh, but just to avoid any issues with that, I'm only initially going to prepare the quorum shared storage. And I'm going to leave all the other ones unprepared and initialized, in my case, even unconnected or disconnected. Uh, and at that point, I can go ahead and say, yes, add all the eligible uh, storage to the cluster. Um, if, if you don't want to do that, you can uncheck that box and, and you'll just have to uh, uh, manually add your storage uh, to the cluster uh, later to build a quorum witness disk. Okay, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and click next and let it create this cluster. It doesn't take very long uh, at all, uh, at least while on fast hardware, it uh, it doesn't take long. Um, so it's it's going to just do some uh, some intra uh, node communication uh, to set up that cluster and uh, and start uh, creating the IP address. Uh, and something else that's very important that it's going to do, it's going to actually create a computer object 
in Active Directory with the name of the cluster. So you recall the name of my cluster was FC02. So now I'm going to have a cluster object, um, excuse me, a computer object in Active Directory with that name. And we're going to have to do something with that uh, in, in just a minute here. So my cluster has been created successfully. I'm going to go ahead and click Finish. Uh, my failover cluster manager user interface is now going to connect to that cluster. Uh, Sven, this is Greg. Um, I, I had a yeah, comment Greg. to make. Um, sure. Because you're creating a computer object in AD, uh, sometimes if you're not a domain admin, you need to get your domain admin to uh, create that computer object in that, advance and stage it for you. Yep, that's that's exactly right, and and that's one of the things that I'm going to bring up uh, in just a second. We're going to take a look in AD uh, at what happens, and and if you don't have the permission to do that, how you can uh, make make your domain administrator uh, uh, have that happen. And that's one of the reasons why once in a while uh, you want to probably take them out to lunch and uh, and buy them some beers. Um, but uh, there's some other things that have to happen too after that computer object is successfully created, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but so what I have here now is I have a, uh, a two-node cluster. Uh, both nodes are up, uh, and both nodes have one vote. But uh, my shared storage, because Windows Server has determined that this is a two-node cluster, my shared storage disk uh, has um, been assigned to be the disk witness. And that is good. That's what we what, what we'll want to happen because we want to have this tiebreaker in a two-node cluster. Now, if I had built a three-node cluster, the the wizard would not have created uh, a, a witness disk. It would not have used my shared storage as a witness disk. You can also see that currently the owner node is node B, and uh, so that means that uh, should all of a sudden communication between node A and node B be lost, uh, then node B is going to have the majority uh, vote there, and uh, that node is going to continue to run the cluster services instead of them all shutting down. Uh, right now, of course, I don't have any cluster services. Okay, no roles right now. Um, now let's uh, take a quick peek in uh, in Active Directory. So I'm going to log on to my domain controller. I, I am in fact uh, a domain admin. And um, uh, before I did the um, installation uh, of my cluster, uh, in the computer's uh, node here in Active Directory, I had uh, simply two computer objects uh, that are my cluster nodes. Um, now, by the way, I would never recommend that you actually keep uh, those nodes in there, but I have been a little bit lazy um, and not done quite everything right yet. But now when I hit refresh, I see that I have a third name. This is the virtual network name for the cluster itself. This is FC02, and that's assigned to that IP address uh, .71 that I typed in. Uh, and in fact, uh, to Greg's comment, um, the, the reason that this worked is because the account that I used to, um, uh, to build my cluster uh, did have the appropriate permission in the domain uh, to create this computer account. Uh, now, Greg said, if you're not a domain admin, well, technically, you don't have to be a domain admin. Technically, all that's required uh, would be a delegated permission uh, to create computer objects in, in, in even in a particular organizational unit. That would be fine. Uh, it does not have to be a domain admin. Now, um, what, we, what we have to watch out for, though, is that in the future, any other resource that I'm going to create in that cluster, including SQL Server uh, instances, they are also going to need uh, to have a virtual network name. And that virtual network name is not going to be created by the, um, by the user who is actually administering the cluster at the time. That virtual network name is going to be created by the identity of the cluster itself, in other words, FC02. So what we want to do to make that easy, and, and you know, certainly uh, in every environment has their own, uh, their own way of doing things, um, but usually it's not too hard to get your domain admins for your Active Directory domain to at least admit that probably it's not a big security risk, that if you put your, okay, there we go, that if you put your cluster resources in their own organizational unit, which I've just created an organizational unit there, FC02, and I've uh, moved all of my uh, cluster objects, the two uh, physical nodes and, uh, well, I call them physical nodes, they're actually virtual machines, but the two cluster nodes themselves, the two Windows machines, as well as the, the name itself, I've moved them into their own uh, organizational units. Now what I can do is I can use the delegate control wizard 
to delegate control to my computer object and and not not all the nodes just the actual computer object that represents the cluster just that one i'm going to have to create a custom task to delegate um, there's no unfortunately no common task there to do what we need to do uh, and what i'm going to do it is i'm going to give it permission uh, to specific object types uh, computer objects okay in that folder and i want to go ahead and to be able to create and delete just in case we delete a role okay and other than that i'm going to give it um full control but again this this just this full control over the computer objects that are in that particular organizational unit that i'm delegating um uh, permissions to okay so now and I'm going to show it in, in uh, very quickly here. Uh, time is going faster than I think uh, always. But uh, now we, we can have in our cluster, I can make a quick fake role. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do an empty role here. There's a little wizard for that. Um, that just uh, gives me a role with nothing in it. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, add a resource uh, to this role. Uh, and that resource is going to be a client access point. Remember that, that client access point? What that is, is uh, nothing more than a name and IP address, okay? And, and this is going to be completely non-functional because it's literally all I'm making is a client access point. I'm going to call it FC02 test role. Uh, and I'll uh, go ahead and give that the uh, uh, IP address uh, 72, okay? And uh, what's happening while I make, while I've made this access point and while I'm bringing it online, and again, it's, it's kind of nonsensical because there's nothing there uh, to, to access. Uh, so I'm going to start it. We'll take a peek back in Active Directory and uh, refresh this uh, OU. And, and there is this test role that I've just created. Now, so what's important to understand, this FC02 test role computer object was not created by the administrator account that I'm logged in with uh, on this cluster here. It is created by the cluster machine name itself. Okay, so that's why I had to delegate permission uh, to do that. And again, uh, every environment is, is certainly different. Uh, usually, uh, you can have a decent conversation with your domain admins uh, and allow uh, for your cluster object, the cluster computer object, to create new computer objects in its particular organizational unit. Usually you can convince them to do that. Um, you know, after all, if you can't trust your uh, failover cluster computer object uh, <laughs> to not be compromised, uh, you've got bigger problems on your hands uh, than, just, uh, than just that. Okay, so, so now we've got a functioning cluster. Of course, we, we don't have SQL Server installed yet. Um, but uh, before, before I even attempt uh, to go there, um, uh, installing uh, SQL uh, Server, um, I do want to uh, talk a little bit about multipath input output. As a matter of fact, I think that's a more important discussion to have uh, than going and installing SQL Server because, um, again, we're talking high availability. We are trying to avoid any single point of failure. Well, single points of failure are often found in connections to your storage. Okay, so um, if Ava is if Ava's uh, group is building a fiber channel SAN, um, then what they most likely want to do is in every one of your physical nodes, put two uh, physical host bus adapters for fiber channel. Uh, ideally, each of these uh, host bus adapters would have two ports. You would have two fiber channel switches, and then you can imagine how you would go ahead and cross. Uh, connect uh, the cards to the switches and then of course you want to make sure that your actual SAN uh, has two processors in it and that each processor has uh, two fiber channel uh, connections and in other words you want to run um, uh, four uh, cables, uh, four fiber channel uh, cables uh, from your switches uh, to your shared storage again crossing over um, I've tried to make a diagram about it, but it just looks like a bunch of lines running through each other, so it's not that easy to draw. Um, so I've given up on that aspect of it. But you want to avoid uh, a single cable cut, a single bad card, a single failed fiber channel switch. You want to avoid that from bringing down your cluster. And so one of the downsides of doing that is that you're going to find 
that if you do not do anything with multipath input output that your targets are going to show up twice or even four times depending on exactly how much redundancy you built in so in other words the same target whether it's iSCSI or fiber channel and fiber channel they call it uh, a worldwide name of course not a target but um, that your uh, your targets are going to show up twice or four times and that is that is not good because that doesn't really give you the failover you need uh, so mpio is is the set of protocols and and device uh, or, or vendor specific uh, drivers that tell windows hey wait a minute even though you've got four connections they're really all to the same target and that mpio also allows you to configure uh, things like round robining, so so you can do some some load balancing, or or just have a connection uh, only for failover and only having one active connection at a time. Uh, but so it's something that has to be considered. So configuring MPIO is uh, done on the uh, uh, on the uh, cluster nodes, uh, and we have to uh, install a role. Uh, for that, uh, and, and I don't have it installed here yet, um, so I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate the installation of the role quickly. Uh, so I'm going in the same wizard, and uh, I'm going to install it on my node B. Uh, again, it's uh, sorry, I keep calling it a role. It's not a role. It's a feature. Um, so uh, multipath IO uh, is the feature uh, right there. So that's what I'm going to check and uh, let it install. Uh, and just like the failover clustering uh, feature, it's, it's, it stalls relatively quickly and does not require a reboot. Now, one of the things that uh, that you do have to think about uh, is that uh, you can't really enable MPIO uh, until you have your first iSCSI target or until you have your first um, uh, until you have your first. Uh, um, I'm sorry, lost track here. Until you have your your first fiber channel connection. Now I'm going to boot up uh, two. Oh, I thought I was going to boot up two extra rules. Uh, I'm going to boot up an extra uh, cluster node here of an existing SQL Server cluster, and and kind of use it uh, to demonstrate uh, what's going to happen uh, with MPIO and without MPIO. And and I think that'll convince you uh, that having MPIO is uh, is a fairly good idea. I'm going to quickly have to pause. Uh, one of my nodes here in uh, in this new cluster uh, to have enough memory to to start up the uh, the the second uh, failover cluster node. So in in my first failover cluster, and and the configuration is fairly uh, similar uh, to the one we just built, except it's a it's a three node cluster. Um, what I have is on node A, I have already enabled and configured multipath I/O. Um, and uh, what, I, what I want to do is I want to show you, this should be booting up any minute here, any second here. What I want to show you is, uh, is how that actually uh, works. So I'm going to uh, be in the process of, of doing something uh, with a shared disk, and I'm going to break one of my iSCSI connections. I'm just simply going to unplug the network cable, as it were. And we'll see that with MPIO enabled, completely transparently to uh, to the to the client, uh, whether it's, a, it's just accessing a file share or whether it's actually SQL Server uh, accessing uh, disk resources, it's completely transparently going to fail over uh, to the second uh, network connection, to the second iSCSI connection. Um, in, um, in the case uh, uh, without MPIO, it's going to cause a failure. Okay, and so so that would be bad news uh, for for SQL Server because you might have things uh, leading to data loss and so on. Okay, so uh, so Node B has uh, has booted up, and um, I'm going to uh, in Node B. I don't know where Node A is. I think I should have booted up too, but maybe the user interface isn't working properly. We'll uh, we'll stick with Node B here. Um, so in uh, in this node, I, I quickly want to show you what it looks like uh, to uh, to have an ISCSI the initiator. Um, we see that I have uh, uh, three targets connected here uh, for on this failover cluster, and uh, but on each of these targets, and I'm going to use the SQL two target. When you go to properties, here you can see that I only have one session to that ISCSI target. So if that session is lost, that iSCSI target is lost. So I have a drive letter assigned to a shared disk in that target, SQL to the T drive. 
So if I go ahead and start making a new folder, okay, now that shared that folder, that new folder is on that shared storage, and now I'm going to plug the net, uh, pull the network cable. Uh, so I'm going to go into the settings for this virtual machine, and uh, I'm going to uh, let's see. Uh, pull the, I have to identify the network cable first. Uh, let me double check something here. Um, this would be uh, the 200, yeah, okay, sorry about that. Uh, so it's the uh, uh, NATED one. So um, I forgot which, which is the network cable, the iSCSI traffic was going over. So I'm going to simply disconnect uh, the network cable that this is going over. And now when I return to Internet Explorer, if uh, pulled the right one, yeah. So Internet Explorer kind of locked up actually while I was trying to figure out what happened. Uh, I'm actually, I promise you, I'm not just moving the mouse. I'm trying to, to double click here on this test folder to, to get into it. And, and I'm not going to, and in, in just a few minutes when uh, Windows has figured out, a few seconds when Windows has figured out what happened uh, to that shared storage, uh, you're going to see uh, an error message. And you, know, you can imagine if this was a SQL server um, uh, target uh, disk that SQL Server uh, would be having some issues as well. Now here I've logged on to my node A. Now node A has been configured with multipath input output and uh, I'm going to uh, show you what that looks like in the iSCSI initiator. And again you may be using, especially for fiber channel, you're going to be using uh, vendor specific um, uh, configuration tools. Uh, probably if you uh, were to use uh, EMC, for example, uh, you would be uh, uh, using PowerPath or, or something along those lines to make those connections. Uh, start to zoom it here on this uh, system. Uh, so uh, here I have two sessions going to the same uh, target, uh, SQL 02. Okay, now the target has, has failed over, but in the meantime, uh, the failover cluster has realized that uh, my uh, node B has lost its connection to that shared storage, and so it's assigned it uh, to T. Now, by the way, my test folder is here, okay, because that was successfully uh, put on the storage. So the test folder is there, but now let me create a second test folder on node A. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do that, and now I'm going to pull the same network cable on node A. Okay. And uh, so there's my network adapter and disconnected. I'm leaving the, the second network adapter uh, connected because that is, of course, the one where my second session runs over. So that's happened right now, but yet my shared storage is, uh, is still perfectly available. Okay. So, uh, well, okay, Notepad doesn't like it, but uh, uh, the, the shared storage is still connected. Uh, as you can see by the ask of the initiator, if I go back to the properties, you see that the properties for the first connection, the status says reconnecting, okay? But uh, the properties for uh, the second uh, session say connected. So um, we can also configure actually what those two connections are going to do. Let me see, there's my new text document here. Um, so, uh, so now I can put something, uh, uh, something in there. Uh, and, uh, and save that, and, and my storage is available. And as soon as I go into my, uh, my VM settings and reconnect that network cable, okay, and of course I'm, I'm, I'm simulating a network cable failure or a network cable unplugged, uh, might as well be a switch that failed or, or something else along that path, uh, but my SQL server would still be up and running. And if I go back to the iSCSI initiator now, I go back to the same target, uh, now you will see that very quickly uh, the iSCSI target has determined that uh, that uh, cable is plugged in again and uh, has been connected again. Okay, so um, I, I know we are out of time, and uh, I want to uh, to see if there are any uh, any more questions uh, while I uh, um, uh, quickly pull up a, a few uh, remaining uh, slides. No, nothing right now? Okay. Um, so a few myths uh, that, that we've uh, hopefully been able to, to address and to bust. Uh, so you technically don't no longer need uh, identical hardware. As long as you have compatible hardware, in other words, hardware uh, that's uh, on the uh, uh, Windows uh, hardware compatibility list, you're good. 
Um, uh, of course, VMs are identical hardware anyway, so um, you, you should be all right with that um, because they abstract a lot. Um, another myth that's uh, busted is that, uh, well, hopefully I've, I've been able to think, have you think about some of these things as part of this presentation, that clustering, uh, it's not a replacement for backups or disaster recovery plan or performance tuning, right? We still need all of those elements in place. A uh, few uh, myths that we've confirmed, uh, clusters are expensive. We didn't really get to talk about licensing. I certainly not pretend to be a licensing expert, but uh, once you start getting into uh, uh, multi-node and multi-instance clusters, you need the enterprise edition uh, of, uh, of SQL Server, and then of course you, uh, you start talking about uh, many thousands of dollars. Uh, your hardware, uh, shared storage, if you go the traditional route, is, is still very expensive. If, if you go the virtual SAN route, you can save some money there um, without sacrificing high availability. And uh, personnel, you know, the, the having uh, uh, people uh, either on staff or as consultants that actually know what they're doing with clusters uh, can be uh, an expensive proposition. And um, uh, clusters do require lots of maintenance. Uh, I didn't get to pull up this slide, but I just want to want to show it here. There's a few things you have to think about uh, with Windows updates and SQL Server updates, um, and that's one of the uh, other really good reasons uh, to have a standby node uh, at all points in time, because you would update your standby node first um, uh, without impacting uh, either the performance or the availability of your services. And then you can do a failover to the to the standby node, which was newly updated or upgraded, uh, and uh, and make sure everything works well. And then you have a new standby node updated, and so on. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about: this around robin failover. Uh, but once you start talking about multi-instance and multi-node clusters, um, you know it's it's kind of a puzzle piece to put together uh, which node is going to run which instance at which point in time, and making sure that you always have a, a true standby node uh, available. Okay, so. Um, what I would uh, like to, uh, again, invite you to do, if, if you have any time left, I'd be happy to answer uh, questions. Um, and I have my contact information uh, up there as well. Uh, if you would like to uh, get in touch with me any of these ways, I'd be happy uh, to follow up with you um, after this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sven. Uh, I did have one question uh, while you were still here. Um, the... Um, I see that you you had a virtual environment. Uh, do you recommend or would you uh, endorse a virtual uh, cluster? Uh, I mean, in, for production. A absolutely, wholeheartedly. Um, that is, in fact, what I'm running. Um, now there are there are a few additional things to consider. Um, for example, Hyper-V replica and things like that uh, often come to mind uh, when you start building uh, virtual environments, or or uh, in the case of vSphere, if you use VMware. <laughs> Um, you know things like uh, replication there, um, so you do want to uh, you do want to make sure that you you have thought things through on that side. You would never want uh, the the nodes of your failover cluster to run on the same physical node because if the physical node goes down, um, you know both of your virtual machines are going to go down. Of course, so those are some things that you want to take into account. Um, but that's the environment that I have running, and um, you know it it should absolutely not stop you. Um, uh, from uh, from considering uh, virtualization for well, whether it's a standard uh, SQL Server instance uh, or or a cluster SQL Server instance. As a matter of fact, uh, in terms of of building it and um, and being able to manage, uh, for example, multiple uh, independent connections to storage hardware and to the network uh, and so on, there is actually some benefits of virtualization there. That's awesome. Um, so. Uh I have uh, customers who are looking at uh, virtualization uh, and clustering for DR purposes. Uh, so, like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, to address that, um, I, I, I want to restate: failover clustering um, is is not it's for um, uh, availability, uh, but it's not for disaster recovery. Uh, I didn't really get to address that, unfortunately, and it's certainly an improvement I need to make uh, when I give this talk or this presentation next time. But um, uh, what you want to do uh, in that case is you want to build a geographically distributed cluster. Um, and, and you can do that, uh, but uh, on the SQL Server side, on the Windows side, it's still going to be with failover clustering as the feature. On the SQL Server side, it's not going to be with failover clusters because uh, geographically distributing um, uh, SQL Server instances is not a good idea for a number of reasons. But uh, what you want to do instead is you want to build availability groups. And, and you can have the highest availability 
as well as get assistance with your disaster recovery plans, uh, if you build in your primary site, if you build a SQL Server failover cluster, and that SQL Server failover cluster, you can then uh, pick the databases that run on that failover cluster and make them part of availability groups, which are designed to span uh, geographic uh, regions or, or uh, you know, different, different data centers. Um, so you can uh, take the availability groups feature in, uh, in SQL Server 2012 and later and uh, use it uh, to replicate to a remote data center. And if you wish, you can even uh, have that replication, well, I call it replication, file replication, but uh, the, the, the secondaries uh, in the availability groups, you can even have those run on a failover cluster. Um, so that is um, uh, something uh, that, uh, that, uh, that might be better explained with a diagram, uh, but so you want, to, uh, you want to build a Windows failover cluster, but you want to use SQL Server always on availability groups instead of failover cluster instances uh, for disaster recovery purposes, uh, Greg, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Uh, so Did you catch that? I, I'm sorry, Greg, I didn't. <clears throat> Do you need to have magic between your two um, storage devices at your DR site, or does SQL Server populate the data from site A to site B? Yeah, great, great question, Ava. Uh, no, you don't need to have any storage magic. Uh, so using always-on availability groups, it's SQL Server that is going to take care of uh, replicating uh, the actual data. Um, I, I have considered with one of my clients actually using the storage magic uh, to, uh, to replicate between sites. Um, we, uh, in that case, you might actually, you, you could actually build a failover cluster. Uh, in that case, you wouldn't have to use always-on availability groups. Um, because the, the SQL servers wouldn't know any better um, as, as if they're really literally sharing the same hardware. Um, but you've got to consider um, that, you know, you use a failover cluster um, uh, to achieve high availability, but, but it, it, you know, only in certain scenarios. Uh, for example, uh, for me, the primary purpose of having a failover cluster is to make sure that uh, I don't have to stay till midnight to do the monthly Microsoft security updates. I can do them in the middle of the day uh, without disrupting my environment, or at least without very much uh, disruption to my environment, you know, a few, few pings that are lost. Um, you know, in, in case of a disaster, in case of a fire in your data center, or, or you know, in our, in our case here in Alabama, you might have a tornado or a hurricane come through, you know, that is going to be uh, really a manual decision to switch to your standby data center. And, you know, with a failover cluster, the decision is automatic. If, if your primary, uh, well, I call them primary, there's really not much, no such thing as a primary or secondary and failover cluster, but if your active uh, node goes down, becomes responsive, the secondary, the standby nodes are gonna automatically take over. And, and when it comes to, uh, to disaster recovery, that's not a decision um, uh, that you should take as lightly as, as just letting the failover cluster do its job. So that's why I uh, advise against doing it that way and uh, recommend using availability groups and let SQL Server uh, manage the transactional integrity between the primary and the secondaries uh, in the availability groups, and you would have to do uh, be the one to make the decision that yes, we're going to switch over to the secondary data center. You may have to change uh, some connections for clients around uh, if you can't use multiple act, uh, if you can't use multiple connections to your connection string and so on. Um, but again, I'm trying to talk really fast because I know we're we're, we're getting over time uh, and you're on your lunch break. But uh, th does that answer make sense, Ava? Absolutely. Okay, well, you're, you're very welcome. Uh, uh, I'm happy to have been able to uh, spend some time with you and, uh, and hopefully uh, uh, introduce you to some of the features in, in Windows Server that will help you build these, uh, these high availability clusters. Well, I'm not pressed for time, so I have one more question. <laughs> okay, absolutely. But I'm not pressed for time either, so as far as I'm concerned, please, please go ahead. Okay, so here's the scenario. Uh, would it be possible to include both physical and virtual uh, nodes in the same cluster? Is that a bad idea? So that let's let's say this um, scenario is that you have uh, you know two physical uh, hosts running a, a, a cluster, and then you had a virtual node as your standby. Uh, would it be able to fail mm -hmm. over to the virtual node? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as uh, as long um, you know as as your virtual node. You know, I mean, the, the, you know, technically, there's nothing that would stop you from doing that, all right? Um, in terms of supportability, 
Um, I, I haven't really read any footnote anywhere that would stop you from doing that either. Um, so the question is, you know, your virtual node, of course, uh, you would want it to uh, to be powerful enough to act as one of the nodes in your cluster, right? So, you know, if you've got your uh, physical machines with uh, sitting there with uh, 48 or 64 or however many gigs of RAM, uh, you know, and, and, and multiple CPUs with multiple cores uh, running hard the whole time, you know, you don't want to ha have uh, have that failover, uh, that standby instance or that standby node uh, be, 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 be some leftover RAM that you had on the server. You know, that's that's not going to work for you. Uh, but as long as you can appropriately provision uh, the, 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 the compute power and uh, and the memory um, on that on that virtual machine, I, I don't really see an issue with that, Greg. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, um, you know, that, that is one of the ways in, in which uh, you can migrate uh, to a, a pure virtual cluster environment. Um, if you currently have uh, a, failover, a failover cluster running on two uh, physical nodes and you want to go to a virtual environment, uh, which are SQL servers, well then the question is how do you do that? Well the answer is you simply build a few more nodes in the virtual environment, um, you know, uh, make them part of the same failover cluster and then you start decommissioning the physical nodes and now all of a sudden you've transferred your environment uh, to a virtual environment. That's awesome. Uh, or, or would you, uh, do you think uh, maybe mixing um, uh, failover clustering and all in, in availability groups so like the uh, the uh, the virtual node would be a uh, AG replica rather than a failover cloak. Uh, if you're talking about it, it being hosted in the same data center, you know, of course we know they have to have access to the same uh, to the same shared storage. Um, I don't see a really good reason for doing that. Remember, failover to failing over uh, to a secondary uh, in an always-on availability group. Is going to require um, you know that that you manually make that uh, a, a writable uh, replica, yeah? and and then um, if this is going to be uh, something that you're going to be doing long term, literally as a migration strategy to migrate to a virtual environment, that may not be such a big deal. Um, but if you're going to do it um, as a as a uh, high availability initiative, in other words, you know I'm going to run this virtual machine uh, as a standby for my two physical nodes. But if one of my physical nodes fails, I'm going to repair it. I'm going to bring it back up. I'm going to fail back uh, to it. You know, then availability groups really aren't a very good choice because availability groups aren't uh, something that you can snap your finger like with a failover cluster mode and have it fail over and fail back just like that. And all your clients, for example, you know, need need uh, well either need to support these uh, the, the 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 multiple. Uh, uh, server uh, connection strings which with some clients don't support um, and uh, or, or and they also or they would have to be able um, you know, to, to reconnect uh, to, to an alternate uh, connection and so on so with availability groups you got a whole different scenario going on all right well thank you very much then okay uh, again uh, it's very, my pleasure to uh, to be able to present uh, today and uh, if anyone uh, has any feedback uh, about the session or again a follow-up question I would absolutely love to uh, uh, to handle that via Twitter or or email. Uh, and the, the last link, as a matter of fact, on the slide is a is a short link uh, to uh, to my blog. Um, I've got a few articles, uh, uh, well, very few actually at this point dealing with failover clustering, but I've got some more coming in the pipeline. And will you make your slides available? Absolutely, I'll be happy to email those to you so that you can post them to the uh, to the Alaska SQL User Group uh, website. Awesome. All right, well, thank you all for coming to the meeting, and uh, this video will be posted on the uh, YouTube channel within a couple of days, and we uh, look forward to uh, talking to you again soon in the future, Sen. Thank you very much. I, I would absolutely love the opportunity to come back and, uh, and uh, do another presentation. Thanks, Greg. Wonderful. So, thank you for attending this May 2014 session of the Alaska SQL User Group. If you'd like to know more, you can contact us at uh, alaskasql at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter at, at AlaskaSQL, or visit our website at alaskasql.org. You can also find us on YouTube, on the Alaska SQL YouTube channel. Special thanks to Global B for letting us use their music. You can also find them on Facebook.